I often get asked my opinion on various topics, including political and scientific subjects, and one that turns up every so often is the topic of global warming, and it just so happens that back in 2010 I spent a year studying this, and other related subjects, at the Open University. So we'll start off with what is global warming? Put simply, global warming is the process of the Earth's atmosphere heating up over time. You've all seen the headlines, the melting ice caps, the increase in hurricanes, all that stuff which invariably gets lumped under the clickbait title of global warming. One problem with this though is that in many cases of the extreme weather that we see, we just don't know if it's down to global warming or if it's just the weather being the weather. We know that hurricanes, tornadoes, they've been around for hundreds of years and almost certainly thousands and millions of years, so there's no need for us to attribute what we see today as being down to global warming. But what we can do is compare historical temperatures, historical levels of greenhouse gases, compare those to the recent temperatures and current levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere while noting the trends. Before that though, I'm going to start with a topic that almost everybody will have heard of. That is the greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases. Starting with the greenhouse effect, up at the top left we have the sun, our home star which powers the climate system on earth and on every other planet in the solar system. Everything starts with the sun, it is the source of almost all the energy and all of the life on earth. And here we can see solar rays, about half of which gets absorbed by the earth's surface and warms it up. We can all see this in a hot day, put your hand or your bare feet on tarmac and you can feel the heat. But some of the sun's rays are reflected by the earth and the atmosphere as well, stuff like clouds, basically reflected off into space never to be seen again. But the solar rays that reach the Earth, warming up the Earth, are then emitted from the Earth's surface as infrared. Some of the infrared radiation does actually pass through the atmosphere. So the infrared just shoots off into space, the same as the solar rays, but most of it is absorbed and re-emitted in all directions by clouds and greenhouse gas molecules. The effect of this is to warm up the Earth's surface and the lower atmosphere. And it's safe to say that the greenhouse effect gets some pretty bad press, but in fact, without a greenhouse effect, the Earth would be a frozen rock because all of the infrared radiation would escape the atmosphere and there would be no heat being held in the atmosphere and on the surface. So the greenhouse effect isn't bad, it is in fact a requirement for life to exist on Earth. But what about greenhouse gases? Now here's a pie chart of the composition of Earth's atmosphere, completely dominated by nitrogen at 78% and oxygen at around 21%. The combination of those two is 99% of the Earth's atmosphere. And then you've got argon at just under 1%, all other gases less than 0.2%, and possibly the most famous and much maligned atmospheric gas, carbon dioxide languishes way down at 0.03%. Now obviously carbon dioxide is a very newsworthy gas, the most famous greenhouse gas, but this isn't due to volume as there is more water vapour in the atmosphere and as you will now see water vapour is also a greenhouse gas, but how do we know which gases are greenhouse gases and which ones aren't? There's actually a pretty simple rule for it which I will now explain. So this is a single atom of argon and as you just learned argon is less than 1% of the composition of the atmosphere and argon exists as this single atom in gas form in the atmosphere and it is not a greenhouse gas. Now moving on to atmospheric nitrogen, N2, and it is simply two atoms of nitrogen. This here is the main constituent of our atmosphere. And like argon, nitrogen is also not a greenhouse gas. Now moving on to oxygen, or the oxygen gas in our atmosphere, like nitrogen. The oxygen gas molecule comes as a pair of oxygen atoms, and also like nitrogen, it is not a greenhouse gas. And now we have carbon dioxide. One carbon atom, two oxygen atoms. And as mentioned previously, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And this is the first rule of what is and what isn't a greenhouse gas. Any molecule which has more than two atoms is automatically a greenhouse gas, including water, one oxygen, two hydrogen, H2O. Water vapour in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas because it has three atoms. Nitrous oxide, clearly a greenhouse gas, two nitrogen, one oxygen. But what about carbon monoxide? One carbon and one oxygen. Is this a greenhouse gas? And the answer to that is yes, it is also a greenhouse gas. It's a very weak greenhouse gas. It does have less than three atoms. However, so long as the atoms are of different elements, then the gas will be a greenhouse gas. So nitrogen, because it had two nitrogen atoms, not a greenhouse gas. Oxygen, not a greenhouse gas. Carbon monoxide, a greenhouse gas. And all of that is basically the simple rule for what makes a greenhouse gas. You may be wondering about the exact mechanism behind it. 
It's a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but in a nutshell, these bonds that we can see here in this water, it's actually more like a spring bonding the atoms together, and this allows the infrared radiation to be absorbed by the molecule, causing the molecule to rotate and or vibrate, and this only happens with the greenhouse gases. So that's pretty much the greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases explained as simply as possible. But let's get back to global warming. How do we know that the Earth is warming? Well, we're recording the temperatures, and temperatures have been getting recorded since the 17th century in central England. Now, you might be thinking, well, how accurate can 300, 400 year old temperature readings be? And that is a fair point. However, from the mid 1800s and onwards, the GMST, that is the Global Mean Surface Temperature, has been recorded with a far more methodical scientific approach. Thermometers and other weather measuring instruments have been placed at locations worldwide in the these Stevenson screens. These little square boxes, which were designed to measure temperature, but notice the slats, it doesn't allow direct sunlight or exposure to wind and rain. These were invented by a fellow Scot called Thomas Stevenson, who was also the father of the famous author Robert Louis Stevenson of Treasure Island fame. So if you've ever seen one of these by the side of the road and wondered what it was, now you know. Now these numbers are simply not in any doubt. So if you're wondering if the earth is actually getting warmer, you can stop wondering. The earth is definitely getting warmer. Temperatures have been accurately measured for around 150 years all over the earth. And here we can see one from NASA and we can see on the left hand side the temperature anomaly in Celsius and the trend is crystal clear, especially since the 1960s and onwards. The global mean surface temperature just continues to rise and rise. This is based on land and ocean data. If you just look at the land data only, again we can see the clear trend line towards higher and higher temperatures. Looking at the left, 1880 minus 0.5 to what is now plus one degree. That is one and a half degrees difference in temperature at the exact same spot on earth, measured at the same time every single day for almost 140 years. And the constant trend of the rise in temperature is clear to be seen. The surface of the earth is getting warmer. Okay, so the earth is heating up and it is crystal clear. But we know that the earth's temperature cycles between hotter and colder periods over hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. And we know this from looking at ice cores at the Vostok Research Station in the Antarctic. Three kilometer long cores of ice drilled out of the Antarctic ice sheet. And this alone is absolutely fascinating. On the y-axis is the delta in temperature in degrees Celsius, while the x-axis is the age in thousands of years. So what you're looking at here is the history of the Antarctic temperature over the last 400,000 years or so. And we can clearly see the peaks where the temperatures are higher, which appears around every 100,000 years. These are known as interglacial periods because in general, temperatures are a lot lower than during these peak periods. The cause of these peaks is due to the Earth's orbit around the sun and also the tilt of the Earth's axis. This cycle will be repeated again. And as you can see on the chart, right now we are in one of these interglacial periods. Generally speaking, the Earth is a lot colder than what it is right now. And this has led climate change deniers to suggest that the current increase in the Earth's temperature simply comes down to the Earth's orbit and the natural cycle. So what's the big deal? Yes, the Earth is getting hotter, but we're in that part of the cycle where the Earth heats up anyway. So getting back to the greenhouse gases and especially carbon dioxide, here we can see the percentage of 0.03%. When dealing with small numbers like this, rather than writing it as a percentage, it's more often written as parts per million. So in the case of carbon dioxide, rather than 0.03%, this would be written as 300 parts per million. In other words, there are 300 carbon dioxide molecules in every million parts of air. And since since the late 70s, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air has been measured in particular at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii and also again at the South Pole. So take a look at the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the past 30, 40 years. Now we can see instantly January 1979, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was measured at 336 parts per million. And you'll instantly see that the levels of carbon dioxide in the air increase and decrease over the year. And this is really quite fascinating. If you just concentrate on the red dot at Mauna Loa, the CO2 rises to a peak in the early part of the year before falling mid-year and then rising again towards the end of the year. But the opposite happens at the South Pole. I'll touch on that point later on. For now though, just continue to watch as the levels of atmospheric CO2 continue to rise month after month, year after year, decade after decade. 
In only 10 years, Mauna Loa had surpassed 350 parts per million, never to drop below that since. And looking at the bottom right, the rise and rise of atmospheric CO2 is clear to be seen. Just as there is no doubt that the Earth is warming, there is also no doubt that the levels of atmospheric CO2 is also rising. And this is the basis of the argument for global warming proponents, who claim that the reason the Earth is heating up today is based on the rapid increase of atmospheric CO2. And it simply continues to rise and rise before we go back in time. The green line is the Keeling data between 1958 and 1979, and from that data we can also see the continued rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you remember how we checked the Vostok ice core for temperatures? We can also check ice cores for levels of CO2, or any other gas. The reason these ice cores are so useful is that the composition of air at that point in time gets trapped in the ice. So we really are looking at a snapshot of the Earth's history at that time, and going back to pre Industry. Before the Industrial Revolution, atmospheric CO2 was around 278 parts per million. And all the way back to 0 BC, we never saw atmospheric CO2 above 300 parts per million. And on checking the Vostok ice core, going back tens of thousands of years to the ice ages, we see even lower levels of atmospheric CO2. Rising every 100,000 years or so? Does that pattern look familiar? It should, because it is very, very similar to the Vostok ice core temperature pattern as you can see here. And even going further back to 800,000 years ago and the West Antarctic Epica ice core, we can see a similar pattern. When I first dug out this slide, I knew it must be quite an old one because the carbon dioxide was 0.03% or 300 parts per million. But today the atmospheric CO2 levels are above 400 parts per million and still rising. So I've decided to update the pie chart. 